Amen. Amen. So, First Kings, and just to orient you a little bit, so um, a lot of the stuff remains the same. Change a few pieces around in those handouts. Um, you have the information about First Kings um, in your handout, where it says under purpose to document the rule and the building of the temple and to record the lives of the kings of Israel and Judah in the divided kingdom. I think it might be helpful to write in here um, under purpose as well, is that the author is wanting, and that's an unknown, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, but the author, and of course we know who inspired it, is wanting us to, to see what happens when you obey and disobey. So that I think that's one of the... Uh, real significant purposes as we go through the lives of these individuals. Some of them kings, some of them prophets, some of them just individuals in the land of Israel, priests. <clears throat> but the idea is, is that we would see why. And, and, you know, if you look at the date of writing, which is certainly something that is, is debated, but if you think about that time in which it is written, and some would even give a later date, they would give maybe even, um, you know, 550, uh, BC, putting that well after um, the the fall of Jerusalem, it's reflective. Now it's compiled over the years, but if you if you think about that, that becomes a little more significant, doesn't it? Because if if the book is being brought together after both the northern tribes and the southern tribes have been judged because of their disobedience and rebellion, and you're one sitting in Babylon. And you're wondering, what happened? And then this book comes out, and you start to read it. It's like, oh, I get it. I see why we're in Babylon now. And you would be able to chart your own national and spiritual history to explain why you're sitting in Babylon rather than in Jerusalem. And so First and Second Kings uh, serves that purpose for sure. So you might want to just add that in there. I know you can't add all that I said, but you get it. You can abbreviate however you want to. Got a simple outline, Solomon's reign, 1 through 11. You have a divided kingdom in chapters 12 through 16. And then in verse uh, chapters 17 through 22, you see Elijah and the other prophets and, and a few more kings. Um, so that's kind of a thing. There's, a, I thought, a real helpful chart. I thought it was one of the more helpful charts. I like the way it was laid out of, of the kings and, and how they came and their dates, it's kind of fun to be able to look and see how they're overlapping. Um, you got those different pieces of the, of the tabernacle furniture that's there, and then you have this scene that we're going to read about here in, in, the, in First Kings, where the temple is built and dedicated, and so some good stuff. And then you have an article that Joel put together for you on the sin of Jeroboam. It's really important that you, you understand that because it's referred to over and over again. And so you might want to take some time later to read that. But with that, we go into 1 Kings, uh, heading into the 11th book of the Old Testament. And again, the author uh, we see here is going to record Jehoiachin's release from prison in 560 B.C. Um, that's 2 Kings chapter 25. In the original 1 and 2 Kings, like 1 and 2 Samuel, were one book. Um, we split them up. But... He, he gives this account, so we know that, you know, we get an idea that there, it's all the way up into that point in time. Um, and then in 538 B.C. is when the Jews return, at least a handful of them, return back uh, to their land. So somewhere between 560 and 538, it's, I think, maybe a better estimate. I mean, you really can find dates all over the place as to when this was written because it's unknown. But to me, I think those are two helpful timestamps. So... Um, nothing to debate about, no big consequence here, but just a, a little note. Um, who are the authors? Well, maybe it was Ezra, maybe it was Ezekiel. A lot of people have pushed for Jeremiah, but some of the events that are recorded seem a little bit of a stretch. But um, those are the, the three that you often will hear, Ezra, Ezekiel, or Jeremiah. Uh, First Kings, which is what we're going to study tonight, is going to deal with the time period between 971 B.C. and 852 B.C., okay? And then, of course, Second Kings is going to take you all the way down to the destruction, and as I just mentioned, to 560. Uh, these were, books were written to explain and to warn the consequences of turning from the Lord, but also to show what happens when you walk with the Lord. So it's not just negative. It's like, look at how blessed these men were 
when they followed the Lord. Look at how the Lord took care of them. And so some important ideas to keep in mind. We're going to look at that first section of chapters 1 through 11. And what we're going to see is that David is going to pass from the scene. Solomon is going to take the throne, not without a little controversy first. And um, he's going to build the temple. We're going to see him fall. We're going to get some details of his life. So the first 11 chapters are really all about King Solomon and um, the establishing of his reign. As we move into chapter 1, we see that, that David is bedridden. He is not able to get out of bed. He's not feeling well, and um, you know he is in this difficult situation. He's about 70 years old, and is no longer actively managing the affairs of the kingdom. Um, in, in verses 5 through 11, Adonijah, a son of his, exalts himself as king, which if you remember from our study last week, that's a problem because God said to David that Solomon was going to sit upon the throne. And this is a fact that Adonijah knows about and as you read through these uh this account with uh you know carefully um that comes out well adonijah decides he wants it to be him so he goes ahead and he assumes that throne and abathar the the priest and and joab david's army commander join with him which is it's quite an alliance you've got the spiritual arm you've got the uh, uh you know the the military and then you have a political leader and the king, and they have joined together, they're feasting. Um, but it's not going to turn out so well for Adonijah. In verses 11 through 40, um, Bathsheba and uh, Nathan the prophet come and they inform David of Adonijah's, Adonijah's declaration that he is going to be king, and David announces that's not going to happen, and he anoints Solomon as king and as promised, and all of the plans of Adonijah fall apart. Into chapter 2, and we'll read verses 1 through 4, David is going to give some parting counsel to Solomon before he dies. It says, Now the days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Everybody dies. There'll be a generation that will remain alive at the coming of the Lord. But outside of that generation, and nobody knows which generation that is going to be, I think every, every generation that has a, long and a, lo- a longing and a love for the Lord expects it to be their generation. I do, but I didn't expect to be 50 either. So, oh well, we'll see what the Lord does. That's in His counsel. That's in His wisdom. And, and, and He says, but I'm going the way of all the earth. Well, all of us are going to die. But what, how wonderful it is when we know the Lord is our Savior, that we don't have to fret over this. Hmm, beautiful. A beautiful hope that we have. He says, therefore, prove yourself a man. It's coming into your hands. Live up to the call on your life and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in His ways, to keep His statutes, His commandments, His judgments, and His testimonies. Pretty clear what He wants Him to do there. How many different ways can he say, obey the Lord, right? Obey the Lord. This is what is written, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. It's kind of a key point to the purpose of the book again. If you do this, you'll prosper. They're sitting in Babylon reading, we didn't prosper. I guess he didn't obey. Kind of a foreshadowing of events to come. Verse 4, that the Lord may fulfill his word to which he, spoke, which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Okay, well, that's going to just fall apart. But I, what I want you to see is, he says, with all your heart and with all your soul. God never calls us to just, you know, uh, meaningless obedience and... Uh, kind of just robotic doing what God said. It's with all your heart. It's with all your soul. We saw this in Deuteronomy. We see it here. We see it in the New Testament. Our obedience is an overflow of our love for the Lord. And so, be strong. Act like a man. Don't be afraid of the hard things that are gonna, you're going to face. You walk in obedience. Enjoy the blessing of obedience. 
And then in verses 5 through 9, he gives them some interesting instruction. I'm going to let you read on your own. But he basically says, hey, all of these people have troubled me or they've, 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 they've gone way further than they should have deal with them because they're going to create harm for you. And, um, and, and Solomon does this in, in many cases. He's very merciful with them. But they end up snaring themselves because they are corrupt people and they never change. Chapter 3. Solomon begins his reign. Verse 1, Now Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter, and all of our hearts sigh. What? What? Why are you doing that? Oh, I mean, it was very common. It was the wisdom of the day, right? I mean, you, you make alliances, you marry um, you know, with other uh, powerful kings and regions to you know, uh, secure safety for your people, but this is not what the Lord said. Then he brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house <coughs> and the house of the Lord and the wall all around Jerusalem. Side note, thought here, Song of Solomon written by, I believe, Solomon, Song of Songs. This very well may be the woman that he's writing about. So um, a lot of poetry. Um, so this is, this is one very popular idea. Um, but, of course, we have 700 choices to choose from, so um, I don't know what the odds are of being right. I'm just telling you what, what often you'll hear um, of coming up. She's referred to as a Shulamite, so that kind of is a problem, but, again, a lot of people say maybe that's just poetry. Anyway, uh, just, just, just a little note there. Um, verse 2, Meanwhile, the people sacrifice at the high places because there is no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. So the idea here is, and it's wrong, they shouldn't have been doing this, but because there wasn't um, a temple, they were going out and doing it at high places. They should have done it at the tabernacle. But it seems like, you know, the Lord is not coming down on them for this. And Solomon um, even does this. Verse 3, Solomon loved the Lord, walking the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. So... Um, once the temple is built, though, the Lord draws a really dark line, deep line in the sand and says, don't do this. Now, Solomon, in this classic portion of this book, um, goes and he meets with the Lord, goes to Gibeon, makes a sacrifice, and the Lord appears to him. And uh, Solomon, you know, speaks to the Lord. And um, the Lord says, you know, ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon, in verse 6, said, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth and righteousness and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child I do not know how to go out or to come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people too numerous to be numbered or counted. That would have been great news to the ears of Abraham, wouldn't it? He said that your descendants would be you know, more than the stars of, of the heaven, uh, heavens. And so he's like, that's a great people. Verse 9, therefore give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Verse 11, this speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. I was thinking about that, that line today. You know, anytime we have a chance to stop and just say, God, I need your wisdom, I need your help, I don't know what to do, but you do, and you've got great plans, I think the Lord's always going to be pleased with that prayer. So you might want to just find out how to weave that prayer into your life as a, as a wife, as a husband, as a parent, as a, as a friend to somebody, as a servant in the body of Christ. And, and so the Lord promises him, he says, because you've asked this thing and have not asked for long life for yourself, nor asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but you have asked for yourself understanding to discern, in, uh, to discern justice, behold, I have done according to your words. See, I've given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. You are the smartest guy ever. That's, that's something. And I've also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. And God's conditional promise is reiterated there, uh, or is given to Solomon. I did say conditional. 
Notice, so if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David, I'm in verse 14, then I will lengthen your days. Then Solomon awoke, and indeed it had been a dream, and he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, offered up burnt offerings, offered peace offerings, and made a feast for all of his servants. Uh, David was given an unconditional promise that there would always be one to sit upon the throne, and that promise is ultimately fulfilled in the Messiah Jesus. And we're waiting for that at the second coming. But he says, if you walk in my ways. And so they had to walk in their ways. The promise, the Davidic uh, promise covenant, though was unconditional. But yet to each of the king's descendants of um, uh, David, they had to walk or they could be removed from that throne. Not at all undoing the Davidic covenant, unconditional that the Messiah one day would. Well, into chapter 4. Um, we have the highlights in, of the many blessings Solomon experienced as the new king <coughs> of Israel. Um, in verses 1 through 19, actually through 21, I'll say, um, you see the, the very many, uh, many able people and capable people came and assumed responsibility in the country. Um, and his cabinet is being selected. He's getting the right people in the right place. It's a big deal. All, as we'll read through the Second Kings, lots of intrigue, a lot of uh, you know plotting to kill. This is no small feat that he is undertaking. And then in verses 20 and 21, what do we read here? It's a great time of peace. Judah and Israel <coughs> were as numerous as the sand by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. It's just a great time. So Solomon reigned over all the kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. So, I mean, it's just a David had beat back the enemy and Solomon gets to inherit this and he gets to walk in, in the peace of that. Don't want to press this point too hard, but I believe it with all my heart. You know, when we as parents walk with the Lord, we make it so much easier for our children to walk with the Lord. No, there's no there's no guarantees and promises that's going to happen, but but you know what? It's a whole lot easier. It's a whole lot easier when when that you know the the tall weeds have been cut down, and you just get to walk behind. And and this is what happens for Solomon. He gets the blessing. His dad fought, was always fighting, but Solomon he's not known as a warrior. He didn't have to. And so um, just an interesting little parallel to take and, and to ponder for yourself and make certain that you're fighting. And you, you may not see the motivation for yourself, but why don't you think of those who are coming behind you? And um, that's true for all of us, even if we don't have children within the body of Christ, we're a family. And so um, I, I, I can think of many men that have gone before me, and what a blessing that I get to walk behind them and, and to, to have modeled for me. Not only in my family, but in, you know, in the ministry family, I, I'm able to see that. Well, Solomon's wealth is highlighted there in verses 22 through 28. I mean, he has a ridiculous provision in verses 22 through 25. It just kind of almost makes you sick to just read it, I'll have to say. But anyway, verses 26 through 28, um, Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. Um, 2 Chronicles 9.25 says he has 4,000. So most would agree that this is just a copyist error that, ex that is found in uh, 1 Kings. 4,000 seems to be a, a number that is more reasonable with just knowing um, how many, what even a large amount, a crazy amount of horses would be. So it's just a little side note there. Um, but um, he has all these horses. Interesting, because in Deuteronomy 17, verses 16 through 17, and this is a key verse for the kings, but especially for Solomon. Deuteronomy 17, 16 and 17. But he shall not, speaking of the kings, he shall not multiply horses for himself. Hmm. 4,000 stalls. Sounds like multiplication there. Nor cause people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, which is exactly where he's going to get them from, as well as other places. For the Lord said to you, you shall not return this way again. Neither shall you multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he grow, greatly multiply silver and gold. Strike three. 
I mean, he, he's going to whiff on every single one of these, um, both with horses, speaking of might and power, um, pleasure with the, with the women, and then just resources with money. Um, but he is given great wisdom. And in verses 29 through 34, it's talked about, but zero in with me right there into verse 32. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. 1,005 songs. All right, pop quiz. Which was his best one? Song of Songs. Song of Songs is like this was his best one, which is we often re think of this book as the Song of Solomon. But of course, uh, contributed to the vast majority of the Proverbs in the book of Proverbs and a thousand and five songs. And his, his knowledge was, was broad. He spoke of trees. Um, he spoke of animals, birds, creeping things, of fish, and men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. He was the Wikipedia of the day, I guess. I don't know. He was Google, you know, you know dot Israel or something. I, they, they went to him to, to learn and to be instructed. And he was a, a wise man. Now, little, do something a little bit different here. I hope it works out. We'll see. You can let me know afterwards. Um, some of you will know I've done this before. Um, chapter 6 and 7, we're going to watch a video, so if you guys can kind of get that right. It is five minutes, and it basically is going to uh, walk us through this, uh, the, the Scripture. The Scripture will be read in the background, and it's going to take us through uh, the temple. And I could read it to you, and we could go through the description. But I think, I think you're going to enjoy this. I hope you do. I thought it was good. Um, uh, just a few things, though, to note. Um, there's going to be two huge capitals, uh, bronze pillars. They're th over 34 feet high, 18 feet wide. Um, you're going to see a huge, well, you'll see a mini swimming pool on, on the back of oxen that holds between uh, um, 11,000 and 18,000 gallons of water. You're going to see 10 smaller carts that each hold 230 gallons of water. All of that was to help clean up from the, from the sacrificing that was going to be done. Actually, when they dedicate the temple, it's almost 150,000 animals that are going to be slaughtered. Um, so, you know, how do you clean that up? They needed a lot of water. One thing that's not noted, though, as you go through this little video, you'll see it. it's the altar, and there's a ramp that goes up onto it, and it sets right uh, next to the big... Uh, uh, brazen uh, pool of water. And this is the altar that's right before the temple. That's where all the sacrifices were put on. And that's where they were consumed. Um, so let's go ahead. Are we ready to roll this? Yep. Okay. Let's go for it. Thank you. And it came to pass in the 480th year, after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, that he began to build the house of the Lord. And the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, the length thereof was threescore cubits, and the breadth thereof twenty cubits, and the height thereof thirty cubits. And the porch before the temple of the house, twenty cubits was the length thereof, About according to the breadth of feet. the house. And ten cubits was the breadth thereof before the house. And for the house he made windows of narrow lights. And against the wall of the house he built chambers round about, five cubits high, and they rested on the house with timber of cedar. The nethermost chamber was five cubits broad, and the middle was six cubits broad, and the third was seven cubits broad. For without in the wall of the house he made narrowed rests round about, that the beams should not be fastened in the walls of the house. The door for the middle chamber was in the right side of the house, and they went up with winding stairs into the middle chamber, and out of the middle into the third. And the house, that is, the temple before it, was forty cubits long. And the oracle in the forepart was twenty cubits in length, and twenty cubits in breadth, and twenty cubits in the height thereof. And within the oracle he made two cherubims of olive tree, each ten cubits high, and he set the cherubims within the inner house, and they stretched forth the wings of the cherubims, so that the wing of the one touched the one wall, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall, and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. 
and he carved all the walls of the house round about with carved figures of cherubims and palm trees and open flowers, within and without. And the whole house he overlaid with gold, until he had finished all the house. And for the entering of the oracle, he made doors of olive tree. The lintel and side posts were a fifth part of the wall. So also made he for the door of the temple posts of olive tree, a fourth part of the wall. And the two doors were of fir tree. The two leaves of the one door were folding, and the two leaves of the other door were folding. And he carved thereon cherubims and palm trees and open flowers, and covered them with gold fitted upon the carved work. And Solomon made all the vessels that pertained unto the house of the Lord, the altar of gold and the table of gold, whereupon the showbread was, and the candlesticks of pure gold, five on the right side and five on the left, before the oracle with the flowers and the lamps and the tongs of gold. And he set up the pillars in the porch of the temple, and he set up the right pillar and called the name thereof Jachin. And he set up the left pillar and called the name thereof Boaz. And upon the top of the pillars was lily work, so was the work of the pillars finished. And he made a molten sea, ten cubits from the one brim to the other. It was round all about, and his height was five cubits, and a line of thirty cubits did compass it round about. It stood upon twelve oxen, three looking toward the north, and three looking toward the west, and three looking toward the south, and three looking toward the east. And the sea was set above upon them, and all their hinder parts were inward. And it was an hand breadth thick, and the brim thereof was wrought like the brim of a cup, with flowers of lilies. It contained two thousand baths. And he made ten bases of brass. Four cubits was the length of one base, and four cubits the breadth thereof, and three cubits the height of it. And on the borders that were between the ledges were lions, oxen, and cherubims, and every base had four brazen wheels, and the work of the wheels was like the work of a chariot wheel. Then made he ten lavers of brass. One laver contained forty baths, and upon every one of the ten bases, one laver. And he put five bases on the right side of the house, and five on the left side of the house. And he set the sea on the right side of the house eastward over against the south. So was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. All right, so I think it's helpful. I don't know. When you read through this, it's kind of hard to start getting lost in the cubits and the, and the folding pieces and all that. So this was the place. Now, you think about it, it's like, man, wouldn't it be awesome if you could have been there and seen it? And of course it would have been, right? Here's something to think about. I think there's a really good possibility that we're going to see something like it. Of course, the Ezekiel temple that's going to come, the, the temple that Ezekiel wrote about, is going to be uh, during the thousand-year reign. But, I, you know, the, this is patterned after something in heaven. So it'll be interesting to see when we get to heaven what it is It was all of this was patterned after. Well, let, let's go ahead and move on down. And I just, as you're, go head towards chapter 9, actually. And as you're going there, I just want to note that in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, um, it, it talks, it says, And it came to pass on the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, in the month of Ziv, in the second month that he began to build the house. 1 Kings second one is an important time stamp in Scripture. I mean, I, I don't have the time to go into it, but this is how you can figure out the Exodus. This is how you can begin to figure out events like Jericho and stuff. It is a key verse. If you ever want to try and work through Old Testament chronology, you've got, you really, it's almost your starting point, and you can move out from there. Well, into chapter 9, God is going to reiterate with uh, David, the, uh, with Solomon, the, the Davidic covenant, and this comes as Solomon is dedicating the house to the Lord. And people come, and this is such a big festival. This is such a big deal. It happens during the Feast of Tabernacles when they dedicate it. And it is such a big deal, they have to add an extra week of vacation. So rather than being seven weeks, seven days, it was 14 days of feasting and celebration. 
And when the Ark of the Covenant was brought in, the, the Shekinah glory of the Lord filled the temple. The, it was so thick and heavy, the presence of God, that they had to, the priest came out and said, we can't do anything. It's just too, this is too amazing. In Chronicles, we read that at the end of Solomon's prayer, God said, Amen, and sent down a shaft of fire and ignited the altar by which all the sacrifices would be there. I think that would have been a pretty cool scene to be at, don't you think? Wow. And so Solomon is, I mean, his petition for the Lord to hear when they sin, when they disobey, when they're carried off to other nations, it's powerful. And um, the Lord says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hear. And so we read in chapter 9, verse 1, It came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire, which he wanted to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he appeared to him at Gibeon. That's where he prayed and said, just give me wisdom. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever. Forever. And my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. So the Lord says, yes, I'm going to hear and I'm going to answer from this place. You know, we've been given equally, if not greater, the promise that God will hear us. And we don't have to travel to Israel and we don't have to go to the city of Jerusalem and go up to the Temple Mount and make that prayer. We are the temple of the Lord, aren't we? We are the temple of the Lord. And the Spirit of God dwells within us. And he says to us, uh, 1 John 5, 14, 15, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Our God answers prayer. He answers prayer. Ask him. Petition him. But learn from Solomon to not make selfish prayers, but to, to seek after the Lord in prayers that are about his kingdom and the Lord's will. And you'll find a whole lot more of your prayers being answered. At the end of, of this chapter, verses 26 through 28, you find out that Solomon also got into building ships to he had all this money. What's he going to do with it? He's got to buy something. So there was no you know, you know, large malls by his house. So he just went around the world to the best malls and brought all this stuff to himself. And, I mean, he brought some pretty amazing things. Chapter 10, he gets the, the visit from the Queen of Sheba. Uh, she comes in. She's impressed with him, with his wealth, with the way the house is established. She brings all kinds of gold, all kinds of money to him. And um, we read here, let's see, what do I want to read? Mm. Let's see, verse 22 of chapter 10. And the king had merchants at, ships at sea with the fleet of Hiram. Once every three years, the merchant ships came bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and monkeys. Yeah, I mean, just everything, right? So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. Now the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear wisdom, which God had put in his heart. Each man brought his present articles of silver and gold, garments, armor, spices, horses, and mules at a set rate year by year. The same man who in, gets all this wealth writes the book of Ecclesiastes. And kind of the, 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 intro, the introducing you know, verse in the end says, Vanity of vanity, all is vanities. And you read through that, and he says, I went, I went nuts. I went crazy. I did everything. I learned as much as I could. I spent as much as I could. I had pleasure. I, drunk, I tried to find the balance between, you know, you know, getting drunk but not being controlled. But, I mean, he goes through this whole list of things. And his conclusion is, it's all vanity. And you can re read this, and you can be impressed, but if you don't understand the personal cost to him, you'd miss what happened. And so we're warned about desiring to be rich in 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. It doesn't say those who are rich. It says those who want to be. You could be poor and fall into the snare. You can be poor and fall into the snare because you've got the desire to be rich. It says you fall into the snare and to many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Well, you've got Solomon as a perfect example of that. 
in, moving on in that chapter, down to chapter uh, 6, verse 17 of 1 Timothy, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Enjoy what you have. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may hold on eternal life. That's how you handle money. If the Lord blesses you with finances, this is how you handle it. 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 through 19. But if you have it, don't desire it, because there's a lot of snares that come along with the desire for it. But if you have it, enjoy it, and use it for the kingdom of God. Chapter 11, um, you know, wow, Solomon's incredible failure with women. I mean, it's just, it's, it's you know, it's storied. I mean, it's, it's almost unbelievable. Look at verse 3 of chapter 11. And he had 700 watt prince, uh, wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. He figured, eh, even 1,000, you know? But what happens? And his wives turned away his heart. Look at verse 4, though. And I've got this underlined. The first phrase, for it was so when Solomon was what? What does it say? Old. Not when he was young. When he was old, his heart was turned away. There's so much for us to learn about finishing well, right? Finish well. There's a lot, many examples of people who started well, but filled, failed miserably in the end. Solomon, King Saul. Stories of those who start well and end well, like Joseph, Daniel. That's who we want to be. But his heart was turned away and he began to worship other gods. He began to build temples for other gods. And you see this in verse 7. So Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And that's because he married a Moabite. That's because he married an Ammonite. And this is going to have a profound impact on his children that are being raised by moms that are worshiping these other gods. And then the king's heart's going to go. It, it just is a, it's a pattern that begins and it does not end well. And this would have been a, a, a high point in bringing understanding to the people in Babylon as to why they were in Babylon when they read this. Very tragic. Well, as a result, as you move through this chapter 11, you see that God then raises up enemies against Solomon. Now, he started with peace, right? But now three key enemies begin to make their way in and to trouble them. And, they, they, and one of them is going to be Jeroboam, who is mentioned in verse 11. And um, this, is, this is going to become a serious issue. And, and into chapter 12, we see that as Solomon passes his son Rehoboam, he takes the throne. The northern tribes come and say, listen, lighten the burden. Verses 1 through 4. Your dad, I mean, he had a heavy yoke on us. We just can't, we can't do this. How are you going to lead? How are you going to rule us? And so Rehoboam asks counsel, verses 5 through 11, and the old men say, you know, tell them it's going to be good. You're going to lighten the load. But the young people say, no, 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 no. Tell them that your finger is going to be like your father's, you know, waist. I mean, you are going to be a heavy-handed ruler, and everybody's going to toe the line. To which the people say, all right, goodbye. And ten tribes walk away. He's left with only his tribe, the tribe of Judah. That's 11. The Levites aren't counted in there. And so it does not turn out well. you got the wisest man in the world whose son's first move out of the gate is foolish. And, you know, I guess it would have been hard to have taken the time to have invested in your children the way he, he should have because he doesn't get it. Um, he clearly doesn't know Proverbs 15.1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Oh, yeah, my dad said that. Well, you should have remembered that and when you were talking to these people. And, um, of course, when the Lord came to this earth, he came not to, to be served, but to what? To serve and give his life a ransom for many. And this is the exhortation we have, is that we should serve one another. This is to Rehoboam, Solomon's son, totally misses this. So Jeroboam, verse 25 through 33, an old enemy of Solomon... And, and, and that's because a prophecy was given to Rehoboam that he would rule over ten tribes because of Solomon's idolatry. Solomon gets mad, wants to kill him. Rehob, me, Jeroboam flees to Egypt. While he's there, he picks up some bad habits. 
When he hears that Solomon has passed away, he comes home. This scene unfolds, unfolds between Rehoboam and the, uh, the ten tribes. He you know, makes a blunder of it, and they walk away being led by Jeroboam. And the prophecy comes to pass about Jeroboam. But Jeroboam is a mess. We read in verse 25 that he built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim. Verse 25 there in uh, chapter 12. Um, and uh, dwelt there. Also he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of those people will turn back to their Lord. Uh, the idea of being to uh, Rehoboam, not to the Lord himself. Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. Oh, uh, What? Really? You're going to worship a golden calf? Doesn't this sound familiar to anybody? Doesn't this sound like a bad idea? And yet, he sells it. So they no longer go to Jerusalem to worship. They begin to worship golden calves. And this becomes, this idolatry becomes the downfall of the northern tribes, as you can imagine. He promised blessing if he would follow. But if he didn't follow, that he would rip the kingdom from him. And he fears losing the kingdom that God had given to him. Small lesson, well, small point, big lesson. Don't ever make decisions from fear. You can pretty much count on the fact that if you make a decision in fear, you're making the wrong one, especially as a child of the Lord. We don't make decisions from fear. We make decisions from what? Faith. Faith. What Jeroboam should have said, I don't care if they go and worship there. The Lord gave this to me in the first place. I didn't seek it. He gave it to me. If he wants to take it away, he can. But he doesn't do that. And he leads them into idolatry. How tragic and how sad. Chapter 14 just highlights the miserable failure of both these kings, of Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And um, they're, they head into idolatry. It's noted in chapter 14 of uh, Rehoboam, that the king of Egypt comes up, begins to steal things, they begin to lose things to war, and his father, who had amassed so much gold and made all these gold shields, they were taken, they were stolen, and so he has to make bronze shields. It's always a trade-off when you decide to walk in the flesh. Now, you can make your life look like the blessings of God, but the reality is, it's judgment. And bronze is a symbol of judgment. So Rehoboam had uh, bronze shields. Solomon had gold shields. It was a blessing in the favor of the Lord versus his disobedience. And he had to try and make up for it. And, you know, it, God's blessings are always far better than that which you can make up on your own. Again, the lesson that's trying to be communicated. Well, in chapters 15 and 16, you get a long list of kings um, both of the south and the north, and it goes back and forth. The one I want to bring to your attention um, is King Ahab in verses 29 through 34, married to Jezebel, whose father was a priest of uh, the, the prophet uh, of the god, false god Baal. And, um, and what we read of him, though, in verses 31 and 32, is that he was more evil than all the rest. <laughs> he was the worst of the worst. And that's kind of what happens. Things just spiral down further and further. Well, into chapter 17, we are introduced to the great prophet Elijah, mentioned in Scripture and other places. Um, I believe that he very well may be one of the, the two witnesses that show up in the book of Revelation in the last days. And you read of the, the miracles that he performed, and it very well may be uh, he who shows up. But he's mentioned in the uh, New Testament, of course, in James, where we read of him that he was a man just like us, and he prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain, and then he prayed that it would rain, and it did. And so um, the exhortation to us is to be, um, is, is the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So he becomes a, a great example of, a, of how to pray in the New Testament. So there's a lot to be learned from him. 
Um, and, and this book introduces us to many of his great um, uh, works that God uses. I don't, we don't have the time to go into all of them, but we certainly are going to stop there in chapter 18 for a moment and, and look at this scene that happens there on um, Mount Carmel with him and the prophets of Baal. In verses 16 through 18, Elijah meets up with Ahab, and, um, and we read in verse 17, it says, when it happened, um, then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, and that you've forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the bills. There's that purpose of the book coming out loud and clear again, right? You, the reason why there's trouble is because you, you, you served the other gods. It's amazing. You know, Elijah's prophet saying, don't do this, they do this, and then trouble comes, and then he gets blamed for the trouble that he warns them is going to come if they don't repent. You probably know some people like this, don't you? <laughs> you tell people, no, don't walk down that path, don't walk like that, don't live like that. And then they do it, and then their life falls apart, and then they blame you for the trouble that comes into their life. You're like, but I told you not to doesn't matter. Sin clouds judgment, and it certainly messes up recollection of the way things used to be. Well, there's a drought in the land, and no doubt this is a trouble that's being referred to and is causing great hardship. Well, verse 18, you saw Elijah with clarity and focus and boldness says, you are the troublemaker. He's not afraid to point that prophetic finger right in the face of Ahab and says, you're the troublemaker. In verses 19 through 24, the Elijah and the prophets of Baal agree to a challenge to see whose God is real. Wow. I mean, you've got to be just impressed with Elijah's faith. So what they say is, you know, let's, let's build two altars. Let's see who, you know, uh, sends fire from heaven and ignites these altars. You get to go first. You can do it however you want to. You get first advantage. And... Um, then, you know, I'll go second. Now, what you need to know about Baal is he was the god of war, crops, rain, lightning, or fire from heaven. Okay? This is what he was worshipped for. Now, Elijah, he knows that the pillar of fire, he knows about the fire at the altar, you know, the temple. He's believing that God is going to do something. This is all taking place at Mount Carmel. Elijah is not worried about the Lord not showing up. He has complete faith that God is going to show them once and for all who the true and living God is. Well, in verses 25 through 29, the prophets of Baal, they do not get an answer. He does not show up for the appointment. And Elijah is a rough guy, and he's mocking them and saying, where's your guy? Where's God? Maybe he's on a trip. Maybe he's in the bathroom. I don't know. Where's he? Well, keep calling and yell louder. Totally mocking them. And then they were finished, and they had cut themselves so much, they said, all right, we're done. This isn't happening. So verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar. I think that's pretty symbolic. It isn't just an altar repair. It's the nation is, needs to be repaired. That was broken down, and Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then the stones he built, with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seahs of seed, and he put wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. Do it a third time. Verse 35, so the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass, at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that you are Lord, God. And you notice all capitals, that's the covenant name of God. And that you have turned their hearts back to you again. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, covenant name, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Yahweh is God. Yahweh is God, not Baal. 
pretty powerful illustration, right? And so, verse 30, um, we see the broken down altar, symbolic of the state of genuine worship and devotion. The Lord is repaired, and the Lord shows up. Then in verses 40 through 46, the prophets of Baal, according to the law of Moses, are executed, and rain returns to the land. That is symbolic of the Lord's favor upon them. Well, after this, chapter 19, Elijah freaks out and gets scared. And he begins to run from Jezebel, who says, I'm going to kill you like you killed the prophets by this time tomorrow. And, and this great, bold leader, Elijah, who's mocks and is telling the prophets of Baal, over 400 of them, you know, well, why, where's, your, where's your God? Is he, you know, you gone to the bathroom? And all of a sudden, Jezebel says, I'm going to get you. And fear falls upon him. And he runs from the north all the way down into the south, Beersheba, and is hiding. He becomes despondent. He wants to die. And the Lord meets him. He strengthens him with an angel in verses 5 through 8, and then meets him at Mount Sinai. And he, and he tells him, I'm with you. And he speaks to him, not in the fire, not in the earthquake, but he speaks to him with a still, small voice. And he sends him back up north and calls him, recommissions him into ministry, and he tells um, Elijah, go get a partner in ministry. Get Elisha. And so he returns in verses 19 through 21, or in chapter 21, in verses 19 through 21 of chapter 21, and um, he calls Elisha into ministry. But you know, it's, it's not uncommon when God uses you for a great work or great ministry that there'll be a heavy attack that comes after. If you, if you talk to pastors and you ask them what the worst day of the week is, most of them will tell you that it's Monday. And, um, and, and it's just, I mean, part of it is you, you've poured yourself out, it's spiritual warfare. I'm sure there's a lot of things that are involved. Um, you know, and so this is often when the enemy comes or on a Sunday night. And, and you may have had a great day and yet you, the enemy will just begin to pound you. And, and this is kind of what's happening with Elijah. Great, victorious... Um, uh, victory um, over the, the prophets of Baal. Who could stop him? He said, don't rain, and it didn't rain. He calls fire from heaven, and then he says, rain, and it rains. What are you afraid of? But he's just a man. Maybe this is what James is referring to when he says he had a nature like ours. Like, oh, okay, I get it now. There's high moments where you're sailing with the Lord, and there's other moments where you're just overcome. And he was overcome, even, he was suicidal, wanted to die. And the Lord says, that's not going to happen, I'm not done with you. Get back up, go call Elisha into ministry with you. And so he does that. Verses 19 through 21, I want to read that, it's chapter 21. So he departed from there and found Elisha, <coughs> the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. That's pretty impressive, don't you think? 12 yoke of oxen. And he uh, was with the twelve. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And spiritual significance of this mantle, you'll see that as we get into Second Kings as well. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please, let me kiss my father and my mother, <coughs> and then I will come follow you. So when he threw the mantle, that was the call into ministry. And Elijah said, Well, let me, let me take care of some business. <laughs> and now we're, we're back to the uh, Elijah we know and love. And um, he said to him, go back again for what have I done to you? <laughs> it's like, I don't have time for this. And so Elisha turned back from him and took the yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate and then he rose and followed Elijah. Obviously from a wealthy family. And, um, and, and you really see the total abandonment to follow the call of God upon his life. It reminds me of the disciples when they left their nets, right? It's the same kind of call that Elijah is, is answering. Elisha, sorry, is answering. So I'm going to go. Hey, God's worthy of, of, of our all. What, what did David say? I'm not going to offer anything to the Lord that doesn't first cost me something. I don't want free. I don't want to give the freebies to God. I want to be all in. I want to be totally in. And so this is why Elijah was so miffed at Elisha when he says, let me go take care of family business. He's like, I don't have time for this kind of stuff. Just go away. They're like, okay, okay. I'll kill him. Look, we'll, we'll, we'll make the sacrifice. I'm, I'm done with this. And 
the slaughtering of those oxen and the burning or, and using the yoke for the, the wood was saying, I'm done, I'm following, I am all in. And he does become all in, and he becomes another great prophet that we'll learn about more in Second Kings. Chapter 22. There's an alliance that forms, and really an unlikely alliance that forms between Jehoshaphat and, and Ahab in the north. I say unlikely because Jehoshaphat's a pretty good king, and Ahab's the worst. So we read in verse 1, Now three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. Then it came to pass in the third, third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. Now, king of Israel is to the north, but he went down because he's leaving Jerusalem, and any time you leave Jerusalem, you always go down. No matter whether you're going north or south, okay, you go down. And the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth, Gilead, uh, Ramoth and Gilead is ours? But we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria. So he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me and fight at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. So they're like, well, let's find out how things are going to go. So um, you look there in uh, verse 7, uh, and they're, they're seeking the prophets to find out how the battle is going to go. And um, they're asking the prophets of Baal, and of course they're saying, hey, things are going to go great. Um, you're going you're to have victory. And um, so Jehoshaphat, again, a good guy, is watching all these uh, prophets of Baal coming and saying this. And then he says to him, is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? He's kind of like, you know, I don't really feel comfortable with these prophet of Baal guys. Do we, do we have another guy we could call upon? Because these make me a little nervous. Look, look at this response. So the king of Israel said, verse 8 to Jehoshaphat, there is still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say such things. And the king of Israel called an officer and said, Bring Micaiah the son of Imlah quickly. So they bring him in and said, Now tell me the truth. Uh, what's going to go? He said, Oh, you're going to have a fantastic victory, king. Don't worry. I'm sure his, his prophecy is laced with sarcasm in the tone of his voice, because he's like, no, 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 you tell me the truth. He says, all right, you're going to die. That's the truth. See, I told you he never says anything nice. That's why I don't like him. And so, um, you know, he still goes out to battle, does not repent with the threat of death on him. And so he goes out to battle. And um, Ahab is, dies in battle. Now, there's a really interesting exchange that happens between Ahab and Jehoshaphat. Ahab says to Jehoshaphat, you know, I'm kind of afraid they might kill me. Um, why don't you dress up like the king that you are, and I'm going to disguise myself. Well, the, the armies, it's, you know, they're going out to fight, say, you know what, only shoot for the kings. They see Jehoshaphat, they come after him, and they realize that it's not Ahab, and they leave him alone. And then a random arrow goes flying, and it hits Ahab, in, uh, in the joint of his armor and ends up taking him down. But you know, you just have to wonder at that when, when he says, you know, you dress up like the king, I'm going to be in disguise. That doesn't sound real good. But maybe Jehoshaphat, listening to Micaiah, said, mm, you're already a dead man, you can do whatever you want. Who knows? But uh, it's just kind of a, it's a, I don't, I'm sure I would have had more to say in that moment than, okay, um, you know, I'll dress up like the guy with the big target on and you don't have to. But, it, but he's preserved. Ahab dies in battle. And was pro, as was prophesied in verse 37, uh, the blood that is shed and uh, is, is cleaned up um, from his chariot in a, a town, a dog, a dog comes along and licks up the blood just like the prophet said it would happen. And there are other gruesome things that are prophesied about his family in Jezebel and how she'll be eaten you know, by dogs and stuff. So, I mean, th this just kind of ends in a, in a very dark, dark um, scene with Ahab, and then the last king that's talked about is Ahaziah, Ahab's son. No, no surprise, he was like his father, and um, did evil in the sight of the Lord. So, obviously, there's a lot that I didn't cover here in First Kings, but you you definitely got the heart of it. You got the, these key thematic verses of why it's there and and what's taking place. But I want to just close with this. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes. Okay, so. 
Um, keep going, go, going right. Go to Proverbs, and then you'll find Ecclesiastes. And I want you to go to chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Solomon, this great child of promise that the Lord blessed and loved, but Solomon made so many mistakes with the horses, with women, and with money. Other things too, but those were three, the three big ones. At the end of his life, the end of his life, this is what he has to say. Verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. The whole matter. This is everything you need to know. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or or evil. You can't fool God. The wisest man in all the earth says, you want me to sum up life? Obey God. <laughs> You're not going to trick him. You're not going to fool him. He watched that. David's, his father had sinned in secret, and there was a fourfold pronouncement of judgment that was going to come upon his, his family. And that's exactly what happened. And I didn't make that note, but at the beginning of 1 King, his la the, the, the fourth installment of the fourfold judgment that actually he pronounced over himself was when Adonijah was killed by his brother Solomon. It, Solomon saw this and was like, you can't hide. And then Solomon, and you know, with the, behind the, you know, the closed walls of the palace, thought he could get away with stuff. And, and he realized, no, you can't. And he realized, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Life lived apart from fearing and obeying God is empty, empty, empty. And so we have this lesson. On a brighter, cheerier note, kings are coming and going, but there is a king that is yet to come. And he is a king of kings, and he is a lord of lords, and he is going to come back, and he's going to sit upon that throne of David, and he is going to rule and reign, and it's going to be right. And we will live with him forever. So we see these kings coming and going. It's like, well, what's the point? Why are we reading about him? Well, it explains to the generations of, of Israel why they had the judgment came upon them. But you know, with each king, there's almost like this little anticipation, isn't there? Is this going to be the one? Now, of course, we have history, so we know that they weren't. But is this going to be the king? Is this going to be the king? We know who the king's going to be. It's going to be Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He's going to come, and he's going to set things right. This is our hope. He may come in our lifetime, and he may not come in our lifetime. But you know what? If he doesn't come in our lifetime, we're going to him. It, it, so either way, the story ends really, really well. So here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments. That's your all. It's all you have to be concerned about. It makes life really, really simple, doesn't it? I just got to obey God. 